Hey everybody, my name is Ellen and today I'm going to be talking to you about a project I'm involved in which is looking into the landscape of nutritional resources we have here in the UK. So what I'm going to cover in the 10 minutes that I have is why floral resources are important for bees, the nutritional complexity that is present in pollen, I'm going to introduce the project I'm involved in and what we're trying to accomplish with it, and lastly I'm just going to talk a bit about the challenges that are involved with in doing this sort of work because Getting pollen out of flowers is not as easy as it might sound at first. So firstly, this project is the result of a big collaboration between multiple institutions, but it is led by Kew and University of Oxford. I'm a PhD student at Oxford, but I'm also associated with Kew, and I've been fortunate enough to be heavily involved in this work. Now, I think it's likely I don't need to explain floral awards to anybody here, but just to be on the safe side, I'm going to give a quick introduction. So when I say floral awards, I'm generally referring to pollen and nectar, even though insects can collect other substances such as oil. These rewards are the ones kind of like most commonly used by insects and they're kind of, yeah, providing like the bulk of the nutritional intake. So these rewards are produced by the plant in exchange for pollination services. So nectar is basically only used as a reward, so it's just collected by insects and it's mostly beneficial for its carbohydrate content. It's really high in sugars and this is really important for basically powering that like very energetically costly flight that a lot of pollinating insects have. Pollen, on the other hand, is a bit more complex because it has this dual function. So not only is it a reward for pollinators, but it's also the male gamete of flowering plants. So there's basically conflict here in like what its purpose is. So the plant doesn't actually want all of its pollen to be taken away, but it accepts that there's a certain amount of loss to phytophagous insects like pollinators. And this conflict kind of raises really interesting questions for its biochemical makeup. So from the plant's point of view, the main evolutionary purpose of pollen is to survive in the environment long enough to be transported to a receptive stigma and then to grow a pollen tube down to the ovule. So for this reason, pollen is really robust. It has like a hard outer shell and it can resist desiccation in the environment incredibly well. And because of its need to grow a pollen tube, which can be like quite a distance in some species, like over a centimetre, it also means it needs to contain enough protein, enough lipids to like power this rapid cell elongation and division. These requirements mean that pollen is like really nutritionally diverse and also means it's really variable between floral species because they're kind of trying to accomplish different things depending on how they're transported and how long they might have to persist in the environment and also the length of distance that pollen tubes got to grow. Therefore, the quantity and composition of like proteins and fats and micronutrients that you find in pollen is like really variable between species. So what does this actually mean for bees? Well, it means that they're foraging in a highly heterogeneous environment, but they still have to meet the same physiological needs. So things like essential amino acid content, like the vitamins they need, bulk protein and fat requirements that are needed for like larval development. And we see this being met in like a variety of different strategies. So specialist bee species may use just like a handful or even one plant species to get all its pollen requirements from. Does this mean that like this plant is some sort of nutritional gold mine? Is it like the all brand of the plant world? Or does it just mean this bee is like really highly adapted to this available pollen and it kind of maybe had some like physiological plasticity, but now it's just specialized down onto one or a group of available pollens. But there's a lot of different factors which will influence which plants bees use and kind of why. So things like their size, tongue length, nesting requirements, emergence time. And so nutrition is kind of not the be all and end all, but it's like a really important part of like how we think about foraging preference and like why bees are like visiting certain plants at certain times of year. And so whilst it's like not the only part of it, it's kind of a really important part that we start to think about the way they're making these foraging decisions. So thinking about the fact that not all pollen is created equal from the point of view of bees and that bees don't necessarily all have the same physiological requirements, we can really start to scale up our thinking of the availability of these different pollen types up to the landscape scale. And so if you then start to think about changes in the landscape, for instance, kind of like loss of certain habitats and like gaining of certain others or changes in species composition in particular areas, a lot of which we've had in the UK of kind of like loss of certain grasslands and increases in a suburban and urban environments. You can really start to think about what this actually means in terms of food resources, because when we talk about the availability of different plants, what we're really talking about is the availability of different foods. And that can mean a lot of different things to different bees. So it might be about 
the quantity of food or when it's available in the year, but it also might be something to do with the quality of the food and how this relates to the needs of different bee species that are present or perhaps no longer present in that environment. And so it's kind of really important when we're thinking about nutritional data to kind of think of what the ecological consequences of this are. And by combining like individual species level assessments of like nutritional composition with things like distributional data, we can really make some like interesting assessments about what is available when and potentially the consequences of this. So in order to be able to make some sort of assessments about losses or gains in nutritional quality at the landscape scale, we need to really have some sort of metric for what we mean by nutritional quality as it relates to the needs of different bee species. Now, as I mentioned earlier, pollen is a really nutritionally complex food source. It contains lots of different proteins and fats and micronutrients, and it would kind of be beyond the scope of any individual project to look at all of these together. So instead, our project is focusing on a particular group of lipids called sterols. You've probably heard of the most famous sterol, the one that's common in animals, which is cholesterol. But what we're really focusing on is looking at the different phytosterols that are present in pollen. So phytosterols just differ in structure a little bit from cholesterol, but they're used for the same physiological functions. And what's really interesting is that bees are unable to synthesize cholesterol themselves, and they're unable to generate cholesterol by converting these longer chain phytosterols. So basically what they eat is what they are. They are totally at the mercy of what's like available in their diet, forgetting all their sterile needs met and so this makes sterols like a really interesting group to kind of look at nutritional resources in the landscape because they're very variable between plant species but they're also incredibly necessary for like healthy bee development. So what this project is doing is basically collecting pollen samples from a really big range of like over 150 different plant species and we're doing this up and down the UK from like a range of habitats and then this winter we'll be analysing these pollen samples for their sterile composition and we'll then be using that data to basically compare between species, see if there's any trends between different families or plants that are like more or less specialised towards different bee species or non-bee species. And then hopefully we're going to scale up that data with a bit of like distributional context and also looking at foraging preferences of some different bee species. And so we can get a real good idea of how important sterols are for foraging preferences in bees and how they're changing at the landscape scale. So what does it actually look like to do this work? Well, most of the time it looks like this. This is a picture of a desk during lockdown, but we also do this in the lab. And basically the week kind of involves going out and collecting plants that are just about to open. So the buds are just about to open and the anthers are just about to dehiss and then bringing them inside so that they can open and we can collect the pollen from it. And this sounds relatively similar, and this is like a very nice looking table with lots of different species in, but where the complexity really comes in is not all plants produce the same amount of pollen and they don't produce it in the same way, and the ease of access also varies massively. So if you think of like a really big thistle species like woolly thistle, you probably only like need one or two flowering heads to get enough pollen for an analyzable sample. If you contrast this with something like red dead nettle, which produces like tiny little flowers and each flower produces a tiny amount of like very lightweight red pollen, you need hundreds of flowers instead of just one or two. And then on top of that, you also have ease of access, as I mentioned. So something that's really open and flat and discoid like oxide daisy, you can basically just turn it upside down and brush it with a paintbrush and pollen will just fall off. But in contrast to that, you also have legume species where the pollen is kind of like hidden away within the petals. So these kind of like pea shaped flowers that have like a banner and a keel and you need to prise it apart with forceps in order to get at the pollen. And for some species like red clover, where each individual flower is incredibly small, this takes hundreds upon hundreds of flowers and you can end up sat for like seven hours. Uh, crouched over your little dissecting microscope trying to get enough pollen out of these things. So it kind of shows you how efficient bees are at getting pollen out of these things. The pictures I've got around the edge just give you some idea of the diversity of the plants that we're looking at, both in terms of like their phylogeny, but also like their morphological diversity. And it really makes you appreciate kind of like you understand why there's such diversity in pollen composition, because the pollen is being accessed in different ways by different insects. It's being produced at different times of the year as well. And so you get this huge, even visible variation. You get like green and blue pollens and red as well. 
from all things that you get in like common UK species, it's not like a particularly rare or uncommon thing to get these like strange and fabulous pollens. So that was just a quick little glimpse into the work that me and my colleagues have been doing this year and the previous year in order to collect um, a big range of pollen samples that we're hoping to analyse this winter at Kew. And so hopefully we can come back in the next year or so and present the findings as well. In the meantime, I'm hoping this presentation has just given you a little bit of an idea of the diversity of nutrients that you get in pollen, why it's so important for bees and what really the consequences of changing pollen resources will be at the landscape scale. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, whether serious or silly, please do shout them out. I should be online somewhere and available to answer them. And yeah, keen to hear everybody's thoughts. Thank you for having me and thanks for listening.